Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the future. I'm Zach Gardner, the chief architect at Keyhole Software, and I have been very fortunate to have some amazing mentors in my career. I've learned from some awesome people. I've had some interesting people that I've met, but I've also had some, you know, not so nice people. And I try to learn from all of them. I try to take the lessons that they have taught me, learning not just what they have done in their career, but also why they did what they did and how they were successful with it. And I felt that it was selfish of me to keep all of this stuff inside of you know the, the four walls of my cranium. So I decided to start this video cast, Next Level. Go out, talk to other people that have been through similar, sometimes different journeys than I have to figure out what are the things that they have learned in their career path that could potentially apply to the next generation of technical leaders that are gonna be, when I retire, the ones that are gonna be writing code and architecting things day in and day out. So I wanna make sure that I can be on a beach in Hawaii and not have to worry about any production issues whatsoever. Today with me, all the way from beautiful Detroit, Michigan, you know, home, hometown boy, Sasha Goldsmith. What's going on? Very great to be with you, Zach. Uh, super, super honored. Um, and your uh, your comment reminded me of a quote from Isaac Newton. Uh, if I see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, so we all have so much to learn from each other. That's actually my second favorite one from Newton. My first favorite one is when the apple hit his head and he said, ouch. That the, that's the <laughs> yeah. most famous, you know, four letter yeah. ouch phrase. That's what I was that has so, a lot more gravity. <laughs> oh, there we go. Got some puns. We're not even two minutes in. All right. I got I to gotta get my disclaimer out of the way. <clears throat> got to put my radio voice. <clears throat> All the views and opinions expressed in this program, the views and opinions of the participants do not reflect their employers, their trade organizations, any car magazines they might be subscribers to. Oh, God, what else am I missing? Any loyalty programs from any grocery stores. We're just two dudes. We're talking. And I think you're actually the first CTO that I've had on the program. So a very warm welcome. To get people started off with, just to kind of get oriented to you, get oriented to your work, could you kind of talk the audience a little bit through your career journey? What are some of the places that you've worked at? What are some of the projects that you've been on? And do you remember the very first thing you programmed? Uh, I definitely do. I actually brought a prop here, and I know sometimes the video blurring is not going to um, work, but this is the actual oldest programming book I have. It's called Subroutines and Secrets. It's um, Apple Basic. Um, and uh, I have to confess, I don't look at it very much anymore. I don't know that anyone's using Apple Basic, uh, but it was a big part of my early life. Uh, I had and I'll only go very briefly in my own journey uh, and, and let you um, poke at the items that are interesting, but I, I've had a very non-traditional journey. Um, never took a computer science course, um, self-taught from age seven. Uh, that book, I actually looked at the, the, the copyright. Apparently I was age 10 when I got that book, um, kind of dating myself. Um, but my absolute first program uh, was from that book, uh, not verbatim, but it gave me the the tools uh, to make my first program. And I think that's a, a good lesson for anyone. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're very rarely going to get the entire answer delivered. Uh, you'll just be given tools and hints. Uh, but there used to be a program, um, and I'm probably divulging something I shouldn't called copy two plus, which maybe theoretically let you copy from one floppy drive to another uh, software that you might not have owned. Uh, I'm only speaking hypothetically, but I love the menuing system and I loved what they could do. Um, and I wrote an Apple basic program over a few months, taught myself basic. Uh, and that was the absolute first program I uh, ever wrote. And I, and I actually used it all the time, uh, you know, just to kind of manage my own files. So that was, uh, the absolute first program uh, was lucky enough to have a second college experience for Price Waterhouse. Uh, spent three months training me after college in how to do real computer programming, uh, which was uh, a really great experience in Tampa in the winter. Um, and then moved over to a cryptography startup. Um, if you're interested in the craziest technical thing I've ever solved, I was working on hardcore cryptography where if 
a single bit gets mangled, the whole rest of the stream uh, is useless and under load, it would fail, but it would work on all of my tests. And I was completely 100% totally stumped, spent two weeks on it, tore the whole thing down. And again, this is pretty low level uh, programming. And it turned out that that physical machine had a defect in its hardware RAM. And it only happened because it was in the upper memory and it only happened under load. And once we figured that out and ran it on a different machine and everything ran fine, um, that was the craziest thing I think I've ever solved. It was very, very early in my technical career. Uh, definitely crazy technical challenges will, will come at you throughout your career, but that one was just the one where I threw up my hands and said, bad RAM, really? <laughs> I mean, that's awful. So um, moved from there uh, through a series of different companies, uh, working as an architect. I put that in air quotes because I don't know what that means. Um, and then eventually landing at Amazon, uh, going from an IC to a manager, leading their uh, seller website, which most people probably haven't gone to, although millions of you probably have, um, but leading the uh, enterprise security teams uh, at Amazon for their seller website. Uh, and then now uh, over as a CTO at a startup doing quantum uh, cryptography. So uh, you never know where your journey is going to take you. Uh, it's it's always fun being on the journey. Um, sometimes you have a destination in mind, sometimes you don't. Um, and maybe that's a theme, uh, you know, take the opportunities that life gives you because um, they only come around infrequently. Um, and it's a combination of luck and 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 your hard work that's going to make that happen. Yeah, I've noticed that's sort of been a, a common theme with the people that I've interviewed. Very rarely does someone's career journey resemble anything close to a line or even a curve. It almost always is a wave of ups and downs. As long as you have sort of a firm foundation to build upon, you have the diligence to understand how to do programming correctly, where it's sometimes you just got to put in that blood, sweat, and tears to really understand your craft. You can use that. And then just when the opportunities present themselves, just being open to it, being available to it. It might not be perfect, but it might be, it might not be Mr. Right, but it might be Mr. Right now, you know, as, as the kids say. The, the story that you brought up about the RAM is really interesting. I know one of the principles that was instilled in me early on in my career, don't blame the compiler. It's not the compiler's problem, it's your problem. And so yeah. it takes a certain amount of experience and uh, I don't know what to call it, seasoning, maybe PTSD or scar tissue for someone to really understand like, this is something actually wrong with the machine that I'm using it on. I, I'm curious if you remember like how you discovered it. Was it just like, you just, like, cause we could, we didn't have stack overflow. I don't think back then. Uh, we didn't have stack overflow. We did have, it is a Java application. Um, we did have the, the original sun, uh, forums, uh, mm -hmm. which I very, very much miss. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful community back then. Um, and they, they, they unfortunately were no, I mean, they, they couldn't have been any help because, um, you know, it wasn't an actual software issue. Um, but it, it was, like you said, kind of blood, sweat and tears of eliminating almost like an Apollo 13, the movie, you know, eliminating every possible cause and getting to, you know, where, where, where you actually had to be. Um, and that's the only time that's ever happened in my entire life. I hope it never happens to anyone else. Um, but, uh, you know, at, at some point, strange stuff does happen. You know, nowadays in a cloud server, you could probably just, you know, get another AMI and 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 it would not have the RAM issue and you'd, you'd move along and be happy. Uh, but when you're just dealing with an actual physical machine that's sitting next to you uh, that has a hardware issue, um, it, it takes a couple of weeks and you run through every possible explanation, but, you know, you get there and say, oh, let, let's go spend a hundred dollars and get a new piece of RAM um, and call it a day. Mm -hmm. And I think my craziest one, it was probably around that same amount of time. I was working on a project where it was a web-based application, but it needed to interface through a Java applet with 
a lot of legacy code that was on the system, like a Windows executable. And every once in a while, when you would do some series of combinations and the wind was blowing out of the south southwest and there was like five percent precipitation all of a sudden just the app would just die it would just nothing would happen and it someone i don't even remember who traced it back to the fact that there was a i think it was like a thread or a pointer or something in the windows application like three steps down from my application code that didn't deallocate and dereference correctly and so that everything else above it was synchronous and blocking so then mm -hmm. it just it just stopped working but the weird part was if you click the button to submit the form or something and then you minimize the window and then you wait and then you open it back up again everything was fine so it was just like it, because that triggered the dereferencing and it was just like how do you how do you do that and it's just it's really hard to describe to junior and even mid-level developers just the amount of ESP that sometimes you develop just working on these systems like day after day, week after week. And I don't know how to give it to them through osmosis. I think the way you could really do it is through just hard work. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the dumbest thing I ever did, uh, and it's super simple. And I guarantee you there are some people out there that are going to do this. Uh, like, you know, the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Um, but I was a developer at the time and I was working on Amazon's help system. And this wasn't just for seller. This was like all of help mm -hmm. across all of Amazon. Like when you go click help at amazon.com, you know, this is the service that's going to be running it. Um, and I made a stupid integer to pointer conversion, super, super simple. Everything tested out well, but once you get lots of hits, like this was 2 billion hits a year, um, somebody's going to do something you weren't expecting and within hours the whole help system was was crashing down and i did page and i looked at the code and immediately realized oh my god that was that was me i thought i tested the heck out of that and no i i apparently didn't um and you, and you, you do you know what's right in that moment you you own up to it and you put in the fix and you retest the fix because you already made one mistake. You know, you mm -hmm. want to make sure you're not adding another mistake. Um, and you get that through over to hundreds of servers as, as across the world as safely as you can. Um, but those are some Maalox moments where, um, you know, your, your heart rate is going up. Um, but we're human, right? We make mistakes. Um, we, we, we try to eliminate as many of them as we can, the common ones. Um, but they'll happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm curious now if we could kind of pivot towards cryptography and you know uh, the quantum aspect to it. It's something that I admittedly am not well versed in. I don't even pretend to be a dilettante. I'm like whatever is beneath a dilettante. I'm curious if you could just you know kind of share your experiences with this technology and maybe where you see it going in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an open debate. Um, it's either going to completely 100% change the world and replace uh, most of traditional computing for certain kinds of problems, or we're never going to quite figure out the whole error correction, uh, spooky action at a distance. But there's, in, in terms of the field of cryptography specifically, there's two uh, problems that are that we think quantum computers can solve better than others. So one is Shor's algorithm, uh, and the other is Grover's algorithm. And they target the two main branches of cryptography. So Shor's algorithm targets asymmetric cryptography. So that's public private keys, that's signatures, that's signing verifying, that's large pieces of blockchain. Um, and then there's Grover's algorithm, which is targeting symmetric cryptography, which is your DES, which you shouldn't be using, um, your AES. Um, and the, the fear is, uh, is twofold, that either some nation states, um, our own government, other governments already have the ability to, especially on the asymmetric side, break some of this cryptography. Um, and then the other fear is disk space is so cheap that we know 100% known fact that governments are just hoovering up ciphertext, encrypted text, um, all over the internet, thinking that they're going to be able to break it in a little bit. 
Um, the criminal syndicates are not too far behind. So that's the real fear is if you have a secret um, and four years from now, you know, the algorithm you're using, the traditional cryptographic algorithm you're using is broken. They have that from four years ago and they're just going to go run it on your ciphertext um, or your current your current ciphertext. Um, so that's kind of the, the threat landscape that we're in right now. And, you know, the, the recommendation from, from me is um, let's talk a symmetric algorithm because I'm more familiar with them. Uh, AES right now kind of maxes out at, at 256. You can chain AES to get higher key strengths, but it's really, really slow. Um, you really need an algorithm that gives you not 256 bit, but 512 bit, or ideally, you know, 1K or higher. And in a in a normal algorithm like AES, um, you're going to get uh, an exponential penalty. So that's why there's no 512 bit AES is why they haven't just scaled it up. So you have the government initiating these challenges um, to the cryptographic community to say, hey, how do we how do we solve this? How do we get something at least 512 bit or higher um, that actually performs? And um, there's a number of different ways to do that. There, there's at least uh, a few competitors that are still in that race. Um, a few of them have been compromised and hacked, and it, it's not an easy problem, right? It's it, it's fundamentally one of those things that uh, I wouldn't compare it fully to rocket science, but it's close. You know, maybe it's in the brain surgery category of of things that are hard to do, um, and, and it's really easy to make a mistake. So uh, there's no shade being thrown at any of those companies whatsoever. Um, but I would say. Um, start getting prepared and start thinking about how do I get beyond 256 bit symmetric? And remember that symmetric and asymmetric have totally different um, strengths, right? So a, a, a 256 bit symmetric would typically be way stronger and more performant than a 4096 bit asymmetric. Um, but it my, my read on the, the state of the world is if I'm using a digital signature or if I'm using blockchain or asymmetric crypto, I'd be worried in the next few years. And, and I'm no, nobody knows if it's been broken yet or not. Um, but I would guess one to four years short of his algorithm is going to have some kind of a breakthrough. Um, again, there might be non-published ones. Um, I think if you're doing symmetric crypto, you have a little more time. It's probably five to 10 or 15 years in symmetric might never be broken, um, but Grover, Grover's algorithm is out there. Um, and it, you know, it is a it is a real world threat. So um just remember the fuel for your crypto, the 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 gas that powers that engine is your entropy. Um, so there are a lot of really super cheap sources of quantum entropy, which is about the best entropy you can get. Uh, source of randomness. Um, so yeah, you can use dev random. That's pretty good. That's not bad. It's it's probably fine for now. Um, you should never use, say, in Java, regular random. You should always be using secure random. And ideally, you should pick an algorithm that has a really large bit size. Um, you know, don't don't just take the default algorithm. You know, look at something that, oh, this is giving me at least 512 bits of entropy in my um, secure random seed. Um, and then, you know, just be aware that there are these new algorithms coming online. You know, some of the super um, known ones like Crystal's Kyber, um, you know, are, are out there and being used. And I think Apple iMessage uh, switched to that recently. So these things are happening and your, your cloud provider is, is probably already taking this kind of stuff into account, um, but you need to protect your own data. Uh, you know, your data is gonna outlive your system. Uh, data has different levels that it needs to be protected. Uh, data has different lifetimes over which it needs to be protected. And data has different adversaries that are actively trying to uh, compromise it. So, you know, weigh those three variables and figure out um, how how paranoid do I want to be? 
And um, just remember that it, 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 there's no there's no silver bullet, right? Even if you found the perfect algorithm, someone can social engineer your company. You can have a malicious insider. You know, there's all kinds of other things you have to worry about. Um, the odds that someone is going to ram the front door down um, traditionally has been very low. It's becoming a risk. Uh, but just remember, they're probably going to enter in another part of your house. They're not going to go through um, the main gate that's the steel door that's got the padlock. It, they're they're going to go through the open window. Mm -hmm. yeah, very much like water finding the path of least resistance. That's what that yep. reminds me of. I mean, it, it's also crazy, too, to think that even if you do have great cryptography now, to your point, if that data gets stored, it gets exfiltrated and offloaded, all a criminal has to do is just wait until something yeah. comes out to be able to crack it. That's that's an attack vector that I had never considered before. That stinks. And there's, I, I don't know of a way to prevent something like that, you know, fully. Yeah. And, and that's why you just have to have lots and lots and lots of different mechanisms um, in place to, to safeguard uh, your data. And and I think a lot of this, I'll, I'll call it good hygiene, right? I mean, I think these are things that we know, um, but there are things that are expensive day to day to implement. And there are things from a, like a procedure perspective that you have to lobby um, your stakeholders to, to want to invest in um, because it only takes one breach um, you know, something like an Equifax, uh, something mm -hmm. like the Office of Management Budget, which is catastrophic uh, for everybody that it happened to. Um, and, and crypto is not the silver bullet. It, it, it's, it, it's one of your main tools. And, and I guess the takeaway would be we're losing one of our main tools. We're losing that front door potentially in the next few years. So start to look around at what would be a more secure front door um, in your own architecture. Mm -hmm. And there are two NIST standards um, that I think are very, very relevant. One is FIPS 140-2, uh, and that governs the current cryptographic landscape. So just if you're not FIPS 140-2 compliant right now, you should be. Uh, but FIPS 140-3 uh, is, is finalized and there are now companies that are trying to, you know, implement the next generation of cryptography. So um, if you're buying software from a cryptographic vendor, make sure they're 140-3 compliant because that is the current state of the art um, for post-quantum ciphers. Excellent advice. Something that I haven't had to think about before. So you know, at least I'll be prepared to do vendor negotiations. But kind of to wrap it up, I'm curious if you had could go back in time and give, you know, the earlier Sasha Goldsmith, the one that, you know, was a very bright eyed, you know, sort of like, you know, rosy cheeked pieces of advice. Like what would you go back to tell yourself in terms of this is something that you're going to learn in your career. This is something that you might want to avoid. And then for those out that are looking to break into technology, like, how can they rise above the noise and become signal? So um, I'm going to be a little bit of a homer here or a former homer because I don't work there anymore. But Amazon has this list of leadership principles. Uh, I think there's 14 of them now. Um, and I'm not saying that these are the right things, but I think they're the least bad ones that I've seen. Uh, Facebook has their take. Google has their take. Um, there's another little prop I'll bring up here. If you're interviewing for big tech, um, cracking the coding interview, this is a really old edition. It's probably four editions later now, um, is a great resource to have, but realize they're going to be looking at two different aspects of what you can do. One is, um, your technical skills. Um, and, uh, there's an awful lot written about what they're looking for, for ICs and what they're looking for managers looking for leaders. Um, and then the other half, which is as important are the leadership principles. So go, uh, whatever company you're interviewing for, they're all um, justifiably proud of the effort they've put into coming up with these. Um, read them and then put your resume next door and write down 
which leadership principles you think a given piece of experience has. And usually a given piece of experience has a lot of different things, right? When you, when you delivered some great project, you probably demonstrated several different wins in leadership there. But write them down because they're going to ask you what we call the behavioral side of the interview, which is um, well, the at the end of the day, the game is if you performed well in the past, they think it's going to predict your future success. So what you want to do is you want to highlight those specific aspects of your resume. Um, and for Amazon, it's a little tricky because there's 14 leadership principles, but usually they're going to ask you something and you're going to say, oh my gosh, they're asking me, can I earn trust? Do I have the ability to dive deep? Uh, have I shown um, the ability to deliver results, or especially if you're a manager. I mean, number one, if you're a manager is, can I develop and hire the best? Um, because um, on your journey to becoming a leader, the hardest thing for me, and your mileage may vary, um, is that it's not your success anymore. It's everybody's success. And it's a real mind shift when you are thinking of yourself as a top performer realizing that you only have limited control and your solution to that is to put mechanisms in place that that work and and continue to let you accelerate your own scope so um i know that's a ton to to digest but whatever role you're applying for whether it's ic or manager look at your company's values write down in your resume and bring that to the interview, right? You're allowed to bring your own resume to the interview and have notes um, and, and use that to your advantage. Tell a story and be sure you're specific, right? It's not that, wow, I solved a complex problem. It's, wow, this problem was complex because of A, B, and C, and I did D um, and simplified the entire problem, right? And that's a different way of telling a story um, than being a little bit hand wavy. Everybody, everybody will appreciate data. Everybody will appreciate specifics. Always got to know your audience. So mm -hmm. that's the, that's the way that I think about it. No, Sasha, that was really good advice. Things that I wish I would have heard when, you know, I, I was a bit younger and, you know, didn't have as many crow's feet. Um, where can people go to find out more about you? You know, what social networks are you active on? Do you still have a MySpace? People go to your MySpace. Uh, I don't have a MySpace, uh, I think. And I've always been a little bit of a, a social media hermit. Um, I, I, I think it's great. There's an there's a expression that I like. Um, I think a lot of it makes more heat than light. Mm. Um, yeah. But um, the one that I do keep coming back to is LinkedIn. Uh, I think people there know that um, you know they're they're in a semi-professional environment. Uh, I do like to post uh, random things about computer science, about management, uh, about cosmology, which is a small passion of mine. Um, and uh, yeah, follow me on LinkedIn, uh, Sasha Goldsmith. Uh, I think I'm the only one out there. Mm -hmm. So and um, pre pre pretty easy to find there. Uh, and, and just a, a shout out to you, Zach. Uh, I, I love all the posts uh, that I see that educate me. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the cool things about LinkedIn, that it, it, it is just a little bit more of a um, no-nonsense way of just mm -hmm. communicating with people you respect. Thank you. Be best GIFs this side of the Mississippi. That's my tag. Absolutely. Line. So, all right, no, Sasha, it was awesome to talk to you. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll catch you in the future.